Welcome. I'm Sharon Dunn, president of the American Physical Therapy Association, and I want to thank you for joining us for this 24th John H.P. Maley Lecture. The Maley Lecture was established to honor John Maley, the former president of Chattanooga Corporation, and to recognize the close relationship shared between the Chattanooga Corporation and APTA over the years. John Maley was a true friend of physical therapy, a generous supporter of the Foundation for Physical Therapy, and a strong advocate for our profession. He served as president and chair of the Foundation for Physical Therapy from 1996 to 1999, and as a board trustee for nine years. Over the years, the Maley Lectures have provided our prof profession with insight, vision, and inspiration, with each lecturer adding to the richness of this event. Let's take a moment to recognize any former Maley lecturers who may be present. If you gave a Maley lecture, would you please stand so we can recognize you? This morning, I am pleased to have the honor of introducing John's son, David. Following in his father's footsteps, David has built his career within the rehabilitation industry, and he and his family continue to call Chattanooga home. Each year, David attends the next conference and exposition to in introduce the Maley Lecturer, and we are delighted to have him here today. Please join me in welcoming David Maley. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 24th Annual John H.P. Maley Lecture. In 96, the Maley Lecture was established to honor a member of the American Physical Therapy Association who has made a significant contribution to the profession in the area of clinical practice. I am proud to announce that this year's recipient is Dr. Beth Fisher. Beth is a professor of clinical physical therapy in the Division of Biokinesiology and Physical Therapy at the University of Southern California. She holds a joint appointment in the Department of Neurology, Keck School of Medicine at USC. Additionally, she is the director of the Neuroplasticity and Imaging Laboratory, known as NAIL. The research at the NAIL aims to investigate brain behavior relationships during motor skill learning and motor control in both non-disabled and brain-injured individuals using transcranial magnetic stimulation. Prior to completing her PhD, she worked at Rancho Los Amigos Medical Center on the adult neurology and brain injury services and continues to consult and teach nationally and internationally on current concepts for the treatment of adults with neurological disorders. During her years as a clinician and rehabilitation specialist, it was her greatest ambition to be a part of the developing physical therapy interventions that would maximize neural and behavioral recovery in individuals suffering from pathological conditions affecting the nervous system. Today, Dr. Fisher's lecture is titled, Beyond Limits, Unmasking Potential Through Movement Discovery. In her lecture, she will discuss the importance of a movement analysis as a key to understanding how a patient is responding to her or his impairments and environment. Moreover, Dr. Fisher will help us understand the critical role compensation can play in masking a patient's underlying movement capabilities and how physical therapists can apply their movement analysis skills to identify and address problematic movement strategies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Beth Fisher. Thank you so much, David, for that introduction. So it's not always clear where we are going based on the title of a lecture. I started thinking, who am I talking about, the patient, the therapist, what I've realized is that the information I am presenting today is intended for both therapist and patient, 
to go beyond their own limits and discover their true potential. In 1981, my journey as a student of human movement began. Appreciating beautiful forms of artistic expression, movement related to athletic performance, movement performed by any body type and across all ages. So as a lifelong student of human movement, I 100% accepted Daniel Wolpert's contention that we have a brain for one reason and one reason only, and that is to produce adaptable and complex movements. There is no other reason to have a brain. Think about it. Movement is the only way you have of affecting the world around you. In his TED Talk, Dr. Wolpert states that the clinching evidence for this comes from the humble sea squirt, which swims around in the ocean in its juvenile life and at some point implants on a rock that it then never leaves. The first thing it does once implanted is to digest its own brain and nervous system for food. So essentially, once you don't need to move, you don't need the luxury of that brain. From the beginning of my journey as a student of human movement, I worked at only one place, and that was Rancho. What I experienced over 13 years was that I, was continu I continually hit endpoints with my patients, but I quickly realized that these were my endpoints and not the patients. I witnessed the potential for recovery and reestablishment of typical or ideal movement over and over again. And that was through the observation that at least one aspect of the movement abnormalities in the individuals with stroke and brain injury that I worked with were the result of compensation. I had the privilege of working with people and being a part of unmasking a capability that neither of us, neither the patient nor I, thought was possible given the brain injury. At Rancho, I was amazed on a daily basis at what my patients were able to do. Two areas of research supported my daily experience of potential masked by compensation. One came from the, at the time, developing field of neuroplasticity, our brain's intrinsic and dynamic capability to continuously alter its structure and function throughout our lifetime. The other area of research that influenced my movement passion was from the field of motor control, specifically the writings of Carl Lashley and Nikolai Bernstein. Generally, the perspective is that intentional, goal-directed movements are planned in terms of the goal, not in terms of muscle contractions. That there are multiple ways for humans and animals to perform a movement in order to achieve the same goal and specifically that metric changes in the execution of the individual limbs can be induced, induced by changing constraints without compromising goal achievement. So in 1995, I wrote this chapter. That was alarmingly 24 years ago, which means I have either been stuck in a time warp or I was way ahead of my time. We'll leave that decision to be made by the end of the talk. The chapter begins in the following way. Normal, healthy individuals, individuals operate according to the following principle. Most functional tasks can be achieved with a variety of movement patterns, but we tend to use the one that requires the least amount of energy and that is the most efficient melding of the many parts involved. Brain-injured patients arrive at their patterns of movement according to similar principles. But if therapy is going to stress or challenge unused or affected limbs and affected neural systems, then therapists must counter this normal tendency. I went on to say, the therapeutic community is starting to recognize that the behavioral deficits seen in the brain-injured patient are not just neuropathologic but are related to the propensity to compensate, do what is easier and less risky, and that movement abnormalities are perhaps 
physical and or biomechanical consequences of the patient's chosen movement strategies. But did they? Did the therape therapeutic community recognize that the behavioral deficits seen in the brain injured patient are not just neuropathologic, but are related to the propensity to compensate? Based on my understanding of what has become the prevailing topic of conversation, i.e. the movement system, I would say it has not. In 2016, a movement system summit, including 100 thought leaders in the physical therapy profession, provided input on recommendations for integrating the movement system concept into physical therapy practice, education, and research, in part through specifying how to develop a diagnostic classification system. While the therapeutic community should be commended for considering movement as essential to a physical therapist's identity, by focusing effort in establishing the movement system on the development of a diagnostic classification system, the movement system is no more than repackaging of impairments. Here is the translation of the movement system classification system to the neurologic patient that was presented at the combined sections meeting this year. The first column lists a number of movement system diagnoses with recognized movement related terms to describe the condition or syndrome of the movement system. For example, force production deficit. How is this different from what we have always done as a profession assessing measures of impairment? By replacing weakness of muscles with a force production deficit, are we actually doing anything different? This position in which I am proposing that the movement system is merely a repackaging of an impairment focus concurs with what David Nichols puts forth in his provocative book, The End of Physiotherapy. He states, I want to argue that the adoption of the movement system as a fundamental principle in physiotherapy practice is really a restatement of the profession's long historical association with a biomechanical, i.e. body as machine, approach to posture and movement. This is an approach that Nichols predicts will lead to the end of physical therapy in part because any movement-related profession, personal trainers, athletic trainers, dance therapists, yoga instructors, who can observe an impairment such as a weak muscle can try to fix it. So what do we need to see? What do we need to do differently? The goal of movement assessment is not to find the impairment or impairments that are causing the deviation but instead to discover the patient's known and unknown movement capacity. The premise that the primary goal of movement analysis is impairment identification is a problem. We are constantly rewarded for our assumptions. We see a patient circumducting their paretic leg, for example, test hip flexor strength, and sure enough, they are weak. With a movement discovery approach, you as a therapist will be constantly dealing with failure because you are hypothesizing that a compensation is masking some underlying capability. Remove the compensation and sometimes you are amazed. And sometimes you may not see what you are hoping to see and have to generate a new hypothesis. Our patients come to us with hopes of improving their functional mobility with goals they want to reach, with life roles they want to return to. We start this journey with them the moment we watch their performance on a given task. It is from this moment when we observe the magnitude of their movement dysfunction that we begin to develop ideas of how to help. However, a physical exam that includes only isolated system impairments or even multi-system impairments like a force production deficit or fractionated movement deficit is not enough to get you any closer to the patient's goal. Remember, many components of our physical exam were developed as a means of differential diagnosis. They were not developed to assist with improving movement dysfunction. 
and therefore, extrapolation of the results from the physical exam comes with many assumptions um, about a causal relationship. Rather than looking at behavioral de deficits as being entirely lesion-driven, we have identified how an individual's implicit, unspoken, unconscious, natural response to the impairments from an injury or lesion factors into their behavioral deficits. Then, the choices that they make to get the job done with what works the best in and of itself leads to behavioral abnormalities and feeds back on direct lesion-driven impairment secondary to limited use and practice. So if our patients choose a pattern in response to their impairments that biomechanically aligns them in a way to use a stiff-legged pattern, we should not be so quick to think they are obligated to this pattern due to a lesion. And we shouldn't compound this logic by verifying that hypothesis through impairment testing. I am looking at movement, armed with knowledge about Newtonian laws of motion and how a change in the geometry of the body segments can change the forces acting on the system. But I'm doing that to identify how an individual's implicit choices may mask some underlying capability. I am hoping that in modification of that implicit choice, a patient can discover a capability they may not have even realized they have. One thing that is certain is that if a patient comes up with a compensatory solution that gets the job done overall, that solution can limit a need to recover a capability. Most importantly, as a therapist, I can help a patient alter their compensation. I may not be able to intervene in a way that improves the efficacy of a synapse in the brain, but I know I can help a patient modify their choices. So let's first take a look at a very clear patient example of how compensation can eliminate recovery. I asked this patient who had experienced a right hemisphere stroke to prepare to stand up. He did something that is likely very familiar to everyone and something I have never had to teach a patient to do. He used his right hand to move his left leg back. What I am about to play for you is what he said immediately after discovering that he had the capability to move his leg back with his leg. So you can do that with your leg? Okay. So why do you use your hand? Because it's easier. It's easier? Do you think that using your hands can help your leg get stronger? No, but it's a lot easier to do it that way. Okay. Did you know your leg could do that? I didn't know if I could move the hand. I didn't know that I could move it back. Why didn't he know that he could move his leg back? because he had never tried. Once he had solved the motor problem in a compensatory way, there was no need to solve it in a different way, no need to even explore solving it in a different way. Five years after a stroke, Sam discovered that he could perform the task with his left leg. Shouldn't this be where his therapy begins? Looking at how compensation may mask a motor capability, I want to start with an orthopedic example to establish that choice is indiscriminate of diagnosis. In this recently published study, Chan and Sigward looked at the sit-to-stand response of people fully recovered from ACL injury reconstruction. The subjects were unaware that they were standing on force plates and that limb loading was being measured. Perfect symmetry between the legs is one. What you see is that the natural choice made by the subjects with ACL reconstruction compared to age match control subjects is to load the opposite limb significantly more. What is particularly important to note is that these people have completed outpatient physical therapy and are fully recovered by every metric used in physical therapy and are making the implicit choice to come to stand using the non-injured, non-surgical side. 
We see the exact same thing, asymmetrical sit to stand in all of these studies in which one side works and one side doesn't. Knee or hip osteoarthritis, knee replacement, hip fracture. Whether chronic or acute, the initial response to their impairments becomes a lifelong strategy. Now in the case of someone with a brain injury, more than pain or weakness is deemed the culprit of the asymmetry. Commonly, a neuropathological explanation of the observed movement is often what occurs. In this case, we are proposing that an implicit choice to use the other side may actually predispose someone to move in a way that has been traditionally identified as neuropathological. So we, we will contrast an exclusive, exclusively impairment approach, um, an, impair, an impairment perspective from a response to impairment perspective. The impairment in this case, abnormal lower extremity synergy in sit to stand. Here is one of the best examples I have, captured on videotape. How many of you actually know what a videotape is? So the video is old, but the problem is the same, and it makes the point perfectly. A young man recovering from a traumatic brain injury, going from sit to stand. If we are viewing his strategy solely with an impairment focus, we would probably say he achieved standing with an extension synergy in his left leg and a knee extensor thrust. Going with the impairment-driven focus, we've assumed that these patterns are entirely lesion-driven, and we define the synergy as a movement pattern the patient with central nervous system pathology is obligated to use. So let's generate our hypothesis related to a lesion-driven explanation for his movement. If the abnormal synergy is entirely a lesion-driven phenomenon, then it should not be amenable to alterations in choice. But let's consider an alternative explanation, something that James Gordon described as a learned pattern of movement. What is observed after a lesion is not just the result of the loss of certain neural tissue, but also the result of the, of, re result of the attempt of the remaining tissue to compensate for the loss of the neural tissue. So an alternative way to describe what you see is that he is making certain choices. For one, he is making the choice to use the side that works, his right side. And two, he's making the choice to keep his weight behind his feet via trunk flexion. His choices lead me to claim this is an oh no wonder phenomena. No wonder his left knee locks back. Mine would do the same thing if I threw myself forward over my right leg. So an alternative hypothesis we could generate, looking at his pattern from this perspective, would be if the synergy is an emergent property of the self-imposed constraints, then perturbing those constraints will alter the synergy. So we work together on making different, potentially riskier choices and see a different pattern in his leg without ever having specifically tested or treated the leg. Now therapy can begin. Clearly, perturbing his self-imposed constraints, his implicit tendency to use what worked the best altered the synergy, thus supporting the idea that these patterns are not entirely lesion-driven phenomenon. Here are his post and pre-attempts side by side. He was injured on May 22nd, 1988, and about one year later, he discovered that he could do something different with his leg, fueling his drive never to plateau. Marty's attitude and his effort shaped me professionally and continues to inspire me all these years later. So earlier I said, that this was an example of compensation masking motor capability. But is it? 
Maybe it is the perfect example of a physical therapist's training to view his movement from an impairment, lesion-driven perspective only that is masking his motor capability. If I have minimal expectations, how is that going to impact my patient's expectations? What is that going to do for recovery potential? Like sit to stand asymmetry for patients fully recovered from ACL reconstruction, or similarly, a patient with a traumatic brain injury, why don't we pay more attention to the fairly consistent across diagnoses choices people make? Raise your hand when you can see what is consistent across these photos. <laughs> okay. Angling the cane out to the side is a perfectly reasonable solution to maintaining support over the side that works. It is interesting to note that the therapists in these photos do not seem to even notice. Again, show of hands, has anyone ever taught their patient to angle the cane out away from their body? Walk this way. This way. I think our patients would be as perplexed as Gene Wilder if we were to say, walk that way. Let's look at another example of compensation masking some underlying capability. Here's a list of conscious, articulated concerns from patients regarding difficulty in moving their paretic limb following stroke. But what they may be totally unaware of is that the compensations they choose may be the source of the problem may actually predispose the problem to occur. The first thing therapists generally ask is, what impairment is causing him to walk that way? We focus on the paretic side, and we start listing possible impairments driving his abnormal swing phase. My question, why is he choosing to walk this way? As I said, I'm thinking about what, I, about what I know about gait, what I expect to see. I'm thinking about gait described as falling and catching yourself. I'm thinking about how easy it is to move the swinging leg because your body is progressing forward over the standing leg. And so I look at this and I see motion being stopped with every movement. And I think, no wonder it is hard to move the paretic limb. It's a perfectly reasonable solution, a reasonable choice for concern with falling onto and catching yourself with a limb affected by stroke. But the choice may actually lead to the very complaints a patient may have with trying to move the paretic limb. The choices that are made modify the mechanics, and I'm thinking about the me mechanics. I may have discovered the role of the non-paretic leg in impacting movement of the paretic leg, but the ultimate goal is for the patient to discover an ability to move their leg in a way they did not realize they could. Can I help a patient discover that they have a different option for moving their leg if the first thing that hits the floor is the heel of their non paretic limb? Watch the video and see if you can figure out what she is doing that is both a choice to avoid feeling unstable, but also contributes to the problems she is having with walking. CS is a woman who had a stroke in 2008. She's very independent, but is concerned about how heavy her leg feels and that her toe catches when she is walking. She would also like to be able to walk faster. So with the observation that she is stopping movement with her right non paretic limb, basically adding resistance to movement of her left, what if we offer another choice? What if we ask her to try and contact the ground with the heel of her right shoe? The first thing that touches the ground is your right heel. That's the only thing I say. Inevitably, I get a quizzical look don't you mean the left leg? 
So let's see what happens. Now she has discovered that her left leg can move in a different way. It feels lighter, she does not catch her toe, but she feels less stable. This is the beginning, now you can treat her. Can she master physically, psychologically, and emotionally the controlled disequilibrium that is necessary for movement? Can she do this all day? Can she do it while talking? Can she do it at night? For her and so many patients, it is worth the investment of feeling somewhat fearful to succeed at this new strategy. Let's look at another example. We are looking pre and post an intervention that was described as an intensive 10 day, six hours per day program. So what changed? What is different? He is faster and using a single point cane at the post intervention. But hopefully everyone was looking at his right leg. When I watch this man walk, I can't help but think he is not even close to his plateau. I ask myself, what implicit choices is he making that may be masking his potential? In this case, to move the paretic leg differently. When I look at this, I can appreciate that the man is faster and has progressed to a single point cane. These are not trivial changes. But echoing David Nichols, there is absolutely no question that it does not take someone at our level of education and skill to achieve this outcome, to hold onto someone's gait belt or walk beside him with a stopwatch. Well, <laughs> what we are watching is his default movement pattern, and we manipulate the default pattern, in this case, increase the speed rather than enable him to discover an alternative strategy. These videos were an upload by the Stroke Special Interest Group. It was a knowledge translation example in physical therapy use of the 10 meter walk test to the Academy of Neurologic Physical Therapy. And again, I do not want to discount important changes that were made. But is this really the best we can do? If we want to reach someone's full capacity, then we need to go beyond this limited choice that patients come up with on their own without a physical therapist. Encourage potentially riskier, more difficult solutions. With what we know about brain plasticity, it is our job to help patients experience that they have more options. The manner in which the profession is aggressive in a holding physical therapists accountable is by having outcome-based measures of success. And these measures of success are typically indiscriminate of compensation and rewarding to the therapist. To me, the most rewarding moments I have had in my career is hearing, I didn't know my leg or arm could do that. So I'm guessing this may be a question on everyone's mind. The answer is, of course not. But once you have seen it, once you have seen some ability you would never have imagined, once you've seen that unmasked potential, you cannot go back. It's like having the amazing opportunity to be in first class. It's really hard to go back to coach. We can't ignore impairment, but if we are only viewing the problem from that perspective, you and your patients will reach a plateau, minimizing capacity. Your patient will arrive at a compensatory solution without you. This is why this talk is titled Beyond Limits. How can we ever use the word plateau with our patients if we have all of this, this iceberg left to discover? Going back to the ACL reconstruction example, recall that even though the impairments had been mitigated, the response is still there. I would like to take this opportunity to thank someone who worked with me on this talk this past year and put forward a movement discovery versus movement impairment perspective with me at a CSM presentation in 2016. For that presentation, the impairment specifically described was spasticity. 
The purpose, the purpose today is not to teach the entire movement discovery process, but to provide some demonstration of it. At that presentation, Dr. Robinson described a movement discovery framework to effectively dig deeper in your movement assessment and capture the patient's current movement capacity and potential to change. I will demonstrate the use of this framework in relation to movement discovery with upper extremity examples. You can start with something as simple as saying, don't do that, to see if a patient has the ability to change a given movement pattern of, of choice, followed by changing the demand of the task. This can be done in multiple ways, such as changing the physical, environmental, or cognitive demands to illuminate hidden or unknown abilities. Watch as she attempts to put the blue ring on the pole. You may notice the excessive forward trunk lean as a means of compensation for the limited elbow extension. Increased antagonist activity, in this case the biceps, or abnormal co-contraction could be blamed, or abnormal flexor pattern in the arm. Instead of asking what impairments are to blame, the therapist in this example simply instructs her to keep her back against the chair. Don't do that. Don't do that compensation I just saw. So again, she reaches for the blue ring. On the very next trial, watch the change in performance when she reaches for and places the green ring. What happened? Did that light touch on her shoulder reduce her spasticity? Providing her an awareness of her compensation of forward trunk lean allowed the patient to use a new strategy, one she may not have known she had. And now we know she has the capacity and we can work within this window of movement availability to help the patient become skillful. Is she an outlier? Maybe that dramatic of a change does not happen all the time, but she is not an outlier, according to a study done by Stella Michelson and Mindy Levin in 2001. By constraining trunk compensatory movement with a trunk restraint, every patient with stroke regardless of severity, demonstrated more shoulder flexion, elbow extension. This research has likely not been integrated into our doctor of physical therapy curriculum because it is not a multi-site randomized controlled trial. So it has a lower level of evidence. But every student, every therapist should come from the perspective of looking at how a movement choice can mask capacity. Now our second example from the movement discovery framework. This example is related to movement discovery by altering the demand of the task. This particular gentleman would like to return to fishing and is currently unable to use his fishing pole. The therapist in this video demonstrates the movement she would like to see and he demonstrates a common pattern for patients following a central nervous system lesion. It would not be uncommon to hear that an abnormal flexor pattern or elbow flexor hypertonicity or spasticity are responsible for his movement pattern. If you were to follow this up with a tone assessment or a quick stretch and find an increase in resistance, how could you possibly resist the urge at that point to associate this impairment to his movement capacity? You have already put him in a box and not fully explored his capacity. Instead, our proposed reasoning is that the physical demand is greater than his capacity. So he finds a way to lift the arm by initiating with scapular elevation and trying to reduce the physical demand at the shoulder. He accomplishes this by reducing the lever arm and bringing the mass, his hand, closer to his body. What this reasoning affords us is a question of his capacity. What if we change his initiation and make the physical demand less? Will we see improved elbow extension? Let's watch a video showing two ways we manipulated the task to see his true capacity. Now positioned in supine, 
his ability to initiate with scapular elevation is eliminate, eliminated, and we gain a better understanding that he does have an ability to extend his elbow while in 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. Now in standing, with his hand on the pole, we will watch the therapist take him through this activity. Specifically, the goal of this task creates a scenario in which scapular elevation is not an option, thus improving initiation. And when his hand is on the pole, potentially a portion of the weight is taken up, thus reducing physical demand. Also, he is moving across gravity in this situation, again reducing physical demand. The result of these manipulations is improved elbow extension. To the patient, he is experiencing his ability to move his hand away from his body, potentially for the first time. He is gaining understanding about the relationship between his current window of mobility and his goal of returning to fishing. Now therapy can begin. The assessment tool that we have used for movement discovery is movement analysis. The use of movement analysis to determine the contrib contribution of implicit choices that lead to self-imposed constraints to the movement abnormality. And the use of movement analysis to determine the contribution of compensation to the movement abnormality. By watching some, someone move and minimizing compensation, you are exploring the question is it really that my patient has no other movement option, or is some underlying ability masked by their choices or the demand of the task? Alter the choice, alter the demand, alter the ability. Movement analysis is recognized as important professionally, but it perhaps is not integrated into the doctor of physical therapy curriculum the way it should be. We need to start from the bottom up and teach students to observe movement and hypothesize how implicit choices may be driving movement faults, not just impairments. To that end, Dr. Chris Powers and I developed and teach a movement analysis series. Our goal is to teach the students a common approach or language to analyze any movement and have that template to compare with their patient's movement. Importantly, the series takes place in the first year of the DPT program, before students are biased by diagnoses and the list of impairments that they bring. It is of significance that even though my clinical experience has been with patients with neuropathology, and Dr. Power's experience has been with athletes at risk for injury or pain, our thought process in using movement analysis is the same. Just by number of neuroplasticity publications, here's where we were in 1995 when I wrote that chapter. And here is roughly where we are in 2015 with currently an even greater number of articles, a significant increase. If we have come this far in our knowledge of brain repair, why hasn't our clinical practice evolved at the same pace? Before I end, I want to thank the committee for this honor and say that the honor to be nominated and receive an award in John Maley's name was made even more profound when I, so, when I so proudly recognized a significant synergy between a topic that has shaped my clinical career and a most remarkable achievement of John Maley's effort and determination to enable patients to regain or maintain their natural motion. Across my career, from very young to now, a key issue is that we have limited patients and their potential to discover other options for movement by a perspective that does not consider the choices they make. In many of these videos, the pre versus post difference was one attempt which tells you that the ability is there, that something else is interfering with our patient's ability to access it. That is what I am searching for in my movement analysis. I started this talk by saying that in 1981, I began my journey as a student of human movement. 
And through a movement discovery perspective, I was amazed at what my patients were able to do. Almost 40 years later, I am no longer surprised by what they can do when some ability is unmasked, but I am still amazed. It's hard to imagine greater success in terms of choice of profession if after 40 years, I'm still amazed at what my patients can do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. I think she was a little concerned about poking too hard on the movement system bear, but I, I believe we talk about patient choice all the time. It's time for us to give our patients choices in how they move. So thank you for a provocative speech and very well done. Thank you.